adjoining Wall Street. Oh goodness. Throwing my microphone around. Put that back there. We have a couple of uh, longer songs to get us started this morning as prelude, so we better get underway. We have a full service. It's very good to have you here. Sing along. The, uh, the, this is a new one from our More Voices, uh, Fresh as the Morning, also known as God of the Bible. Beautiful, beautiful piece. God of the Bible, God in the Gospel, hope seen in Jesus, hope yet to come. You are our center, daylight or darkness, freedom or prison, you are our home. Fresh as the morning, sure as the sunrise, God always faithful, you do not change. Fresh as the morning, sure as the sunrise, God always faithful, you do not change. struggles, God in our hunger, suffering with us, taking our part. Still you empower us, Father in spirit, feeding, sustaining from your own heart. Fresh as the morning, sure as the sunrise, God always faithful, you do not change. Fresh as the morning, Sure as the sunrise, God always faithful, you do not change. Those without status, those who are nothing, you have made royal, gifted with rights, chosen as partners, midwives of justice, birthing new systems. Like you rise, fresh as the morning, sure as the sunrise, God always faithful, you do not change. Fresh as the morning, sure as the sunrise, God always faithful, you do not change. wings out of our hymn book also words on screen but we'll sing 
the chorus. And I will raise you up on eagles' wings, bear you on the breath of dawn, paint you to shine like the sun, and hold you in the palm of my hand. You who dwell in the shelter of our God, who abide in the shadow of our love, Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Wall Street United Church. It's an absolutely beautiful Sunday morning. The rain has finally stopped. The sun is shining. And it's great to have you here on a beautiful morning. Um, as you, I think, are all aware, uh, Pastor Kim is away on sabbatical. She's actually in Berlin, in Germany. And uh, Pastor David is on vacation, and he should be somewhere on the high seas at this point. <laughs> and so keep them both in your thoughts and in your prayers. And uh, second thing I want to say is Happy Father's Day. And uh, <laughs> if you are a father, or if you had a father, Happy Father's Day. It's good to, good to celebrate these things. If you're new to this church... Uh, Please make yourself known to us afterwards. We'd love to greet you. And uh, a good way to do it is to go into the room right behind the sanctuary, which we call Heritage Hall. Coffee is served and tea, and uh, it's a good way to mix and to actually meet people. And, there's and now let us quieten our hearts and minds as we seek the face and the love and the grace of God. That's why we're here. We're here to worship God. We're here to seek his face. 
I invite you to lay your burdens down because every one of us has something that's bothering us. Just set it down and seek God's love and God's grace this day. And we're going to uh, start our service by singing a hymn. And the, uh, the hymn is a really joyful, uplifting one. It's based on Isaiah 55. A lot of our hymns are based on scripture. And this one is called, You Shall Go Out With Joy. So if you're not awake now, you will be by the end of this. And I invite you to stand and clap where you're supposed to in this wonderful hymn. Shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills will bring forth before you. There'll be shouts of joy, and all the trees of the field will clap, will clap their hands. And all the trees of the fields will. thank you that we can be in a place like this and we ask now that your spirit will stir in our presence to lift our hearts that we might see and know you in a new way and that all those things that we lay down before you when we pick them up they will be lighter in Jesus name amen this is the time when I normally do the children's story Mm, and I only see one we one. Never fear, we'll do it anyway. I was a going to... We're hiding, aren't we? Yeah, that's okay, you can hide there. <laughs> it's hard to be the only one. No worries. I was going to ask the kids, what is the most important thing, or what is most important to a dog? And of course, there are a variety of answers. Well, one would be food. And of course, there's always one little wag that will want to try it, but not today. Not today. And, and then uh, there's always toys. <laughs> Throw up in the air and all that. And there's no doubt that Toys are very important to it. This is quite the toy, isn't it? I laugh myself silly. Um, they tell me it's something you find on the road. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and um, then there were other things like taking a dog for a walk and what they like to do on their walk is most important. But I have discovered in all the years that, that, that Lily Jean and I have had dogs, that all of that is, yes, food is always important and playing and all the rest of it, but first, a dog must belong to someone. 
absolutely essential in the heart of a dog that it belong to someone. And if it doesn't belong to a person, it has to belong to a pack, or it has to attach itself to another animal. You often will see uh, uh, one of these, these, these odd situations where a dog and a, and a pig will become fast friends, or a dog and a horse. You know, it's very common, because particularly for the dog, they have to belong. They have to have somebody that is their pack. And it's no different with human creatures. You know, uh, Maslow's order of, uh, of needs, you know, first it's food, and then it's shelter, and then, and then finally down at the bottom is it's the spiritual thing, you know, at the top, I guess. But after, you know, sort of the basic of food and shelter, it's belonging. You've got to belong. And essentially, that is what we're here for. We have discovered that we belong to God. And each week we come here to reinforce it and make it stronger. Isn't that great? Let's say a prayer, with, please. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. That we belong, that we belong to, you, to you. And that we are very special, we are very special. to you. Amen.
The readings this morning are from Elijah. It's from Kings, chapter 17, verses 8 to 16. The Lord told Elijah, go to the town of Zarephath in Sidon and live there. I told the widow in that town to give you food. When Elijah came near the town gate of Zarephath, he saw a widow gathering sticks for a fire. Would you please bring me a cup of water, he asked. As she left to get it, he asked, would you also please bring me a piece of bread? The widow answered, in the name of the living God, Lord your God, I swear that I don't have any bread. All I have is a handful of flour and a little olive oil. I'm on my way home now with these few sticks to cook what I have for my son and me. After that, we will starve to death. Elijah said, everything will be fine. Do what you said. Go home and fix something for you and your son. But first, please make a small piece of bread and bring it to me. The Lord God of Israel has promised that your jar of flour won't run out and your bottle of oil won't dry up before he sends rain for the crops. The widow went home and did exactly what Elijah had told her. She and Elijah and her family had enough food for a long time. The Lord kept the promise that his prophet Elijah had made and she did not run out of flour or oil. The next reading is from Mark chapter 12, verses 41 to 44. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a fraction of a penny. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, I tell you the truth. This poor widow has put more into the treasure, treasury than all of the others. They gave out of their wealth, but she out of her poverty put in everything, all she had to live on. In these readings, we hear God's voice. Thanks be to God. All who are thirsty, it's uh, from our more voices. Um, but you can remain seated while we sing this prayer song.
Be present with us, Father God, Father, Mother God. Be present with us. We gather here in this special place at this special time. And we know, we know that we belong to you. We don't always feel like we belong to you. We don't always act like we belong to you. We don't always do the things that would show that we've really committed to you, yet, yet you love us as we are. But more than that, you love us enough that as we draw near to you, we begin to become all that you would have us be. And so we are in a process with you, Lord, of growing up into our faith, of growing up in life, and to, of all those things that occur in our lives when we come near to you, we live them differently. We live them stronger. We live them better. We build new and better out of all that happens with you. And so it is that we reaffirm our lives belong to you. Our hearts are open to you. And our minds, that's the hard part. We don't really understand this life. And I suppose as a little child asks all the questions about why the sky is blue and where the flowers come from and where the babies come from and all those questions that are impossible for the child to understand and we struggle to give them good and simple answers, so too, Lord, we come before you not understanding life not understanding why it has to hurt so much, not understanding why there has to be so much conflict and war and evil and death and hurt and pain. and We just don't know. But as we draw near to you and we are held by you, we know that you know. So instead of knowing all the answers, Lord God, we know the one who knows all the answers and that's good enough. Probably better. Because if you told us the answers, we wouldn't understand anyway. So, Lord, we are your wee children. We crawl up on your lap. We snuggle in close. And we pray that we would remember to do this every day, even a little bit, so that we might walk our lives with new joy and hope strength and direction, for we are yours, through Jesus Christ. Amen. The uh, title of my message is uh, Feeling Insecure, and I want to begin with a story that goes back to the 1960s. It, it took place in Indianapolis in the United States, but it made headlines across North America. I remember I was living in Toronto at the time, and I remember reading about it in amazement. A widow was found dead in her home. And uh, it turned out she was a wealthy widow, and the reason why we know is that upon entry, the police discovered she had more than $5 million in cash in her house. I can tell you $5 million was a lot more in the 1960s than it is today, and it's a lot of money today. It was stuffed in trash cans. It was in dresser drawers. It was in toolboxes. It was in garbage bags. It was even in her vacuum cleaner. <laughs> Turned out her husband had been heir to a fortune and had died 10 years earlier. Now this lady obviously did not trust or believe in banks. The police said that she was well known to them. They had responded over the years to numerous calls from the lady reporting attempted burglaries. But every time they arrived, she'd always ordered them off the property. The coroner's report 
stated that the woman had died from malnutrition. Five million dollars. And she didn't have enough, apparently, to go to the grocery store and buy food. What a bizarre story. And yet, in spite of how crazy that story is, I think the truth is we all have a little bit in common with that woman. Because like her, all of us worry about running out of money. There is an almost universal desire to save enough for a rainy day. And studies confirm consistently that everyone, all people, are concerned about making ends meet, and many have a dreadful fear of poverty in their old age. And it would be so much easier if we knew when we were going to croak. <laughs> then we would know how much money we need. But we don't. <laughs> the corollary to the problem is that uh, it seems that our best security lies in possessing as much money as we possibly can. The more the better. Do you remember Voltaire, the famous French philosopher? Well, Voltaire once said, when it comes to money, everybody is of the same religion. <laughs> So, how much does a person need to be secure? It's a good question. In the 1800s, Leo Tolstoy wrote a short story entitled, How Much Land Does a Man Need? Now keep in mind in the 1800s, land equals wealth. I mean, let's face it, it still does today, but even more so. So you could almost think of how much wealth does a man need? How much land does a man need? Well, in this story, the man is promised all the land that he can walk around between sunup and sundown in one day. He has to leave his markers in the four corners and he has to be back before the sun dips below the horizon. Well, it was, it was like winning the lottery. I mean, it was the chance of a lifetime to finally be secure. He was a man of very modest means. Just to walk around and that land would be yours? He couldn't believe it. He was so excited. And on that big day, he got up well before sunrise. And the moment the sun rose above the horizon, he set off at a furious pace. He stepped off as long a side as he could in a quarter of the time. He did the same for the second and the third quarters. Although the rapid pace he had set at the beginning was starting to take a toll on him because he wasn't fresh like he was in the morning and he was not a young man. Well, he summoned every ounce of energy he had for the final lap. This, this was his one chance for wealth. This was his one chance for security. He would never get it again. And at last he could see the finish line up ahead. His chest was pounding and burning. His legs were wooden. But somehow he kept up the pace, staggered across the finish line just as the sun was setting only to fall dead of a heart attack. How much land did the man need? They buried him in a plot six feet by two. In the end, that was all he needed. And in the end, that's all we're going to need. How much security can we really have? Our two scripture stories this morning are of two widows. One was from Zarephath in the days of Elijah. It was a time when famine, they used to call it the silent killer, was stalking the land. And the uh, prophet asked for some food. 
from this widow. He met her on the road. And she told him that she barely had enough left for one meal for herself and her son, and after that, they would die. It was as simple and as certain as that. I mean, in ancient times, when the crops failed and famine struck, people died. Food supplies did not come in from elsewhere the way they do today. And yet, the amazing thing is that when asked, she did share her food with Elijah. She gave him something to eat. Now why? <laughs> why would she do that? Was it because he was a prophet and she had faith in a prophet of God? The story doesn't say. And possibly. But I doubt it. You see, Zarephath is miles north of Israel in, in what we would call Lebanon today. And very likely the woman wasn't even Jewish. She probably had never seen Elijah in her life before and never heard of him. And besides... <laughs> As far as being a prophet was concerned, there were cult prophets everywhere in the ancient Middle East. They, they were a dime a dozen. I don't think that's why she shared her food. I think, it, I think it was something deeper. I think she was simply unable to say no. He was standing in front of her, and he was starving. And she had to help because he was there, and he needed the help. How many of you remember a former United Church moderator by the name of Dr. Robert McClure? Quite a few of you do. In the United Church, we called the head honcho what the Roman Catholics would call the Pope. <laughs> we call him the, or her the moderator of our church. And in the 1960s, uh, no, actually it was the 1970s, Dr. McClure, who had been a missionary doctor all his life and come back home, was elected to be the head of our church. And I was at a, uh, an outdoor service that he was speaking at. And I remember him telling us this. He said, the very same people who will not give to the mission fund of our church and who will not support World Vision or OK Kids or the Red Cross, they just don't give to these type of things, these very same people, if they were to open their front door and find a starving child in, in front of them, would empty their refrigerators to feed the child. In other words, most people are not hard-hearted. They just have to see the need. Our New Testament story is not quite as dramatic, but it does make the same point. Jesus was in the temple, and he was watching people give their offerings. Now, there used to be this great whacking cauldron made out of, of, of brass and gold, and people would put their money when they came into the temple. And if you were a wealthy person, you would hire a guy like me who can play a trumpet, and you would make a big, big racket and a big sound, because you want everybody to see you're putting in a lot of money. And, uh, yeah, you could make, it's a, a good gig, Mac, you know, playing in the temple as the rich guys put their money in. But anyway, Jesus was not impressed until he saw a poor widow put in two copper coins worth about an eighth of a penny. And that gift so moved him that he called his disciples together to tell him about this amazing act of generosity he had seen. And it was amazing because she had actually given everything that she had. Have you ever done that? I sure have not. I doubt if anybody here has. And every time I read that story, my, ma my mind goes back to my years in Zambia where I used to actually watch that sort of thing. In the little Zambian churches that I would preach in, little one-room thatch huts places, we didn't have nice offering plates. In fact, <laughs> we didn't even have offering plates. Um, 
at the offering time, the people would come forward. In every Zambian church I was in, people always came forward to present their offerings. And they would put them on the communion table. Not a beautifully carved communion table like here, but often a rickety little table. But it was the communion table. And as the pastor, I, I would stand behind. And what would happen is somebody would start a hymn. And everybody would join in and start singing. And they would sing as they came forward and presented their offerings. Now they didn't have a praise team. They didn't have guitars. They didn't have trumpets. They didn't have an organ or a piano. They sang a cappella. They didn't even have hymn books. <laughs> that wasn't a problem. They all knew the words to a gazillion hymns by heart, and they sang. And many, many times I would watch a poor Zambian mother with a baby on her back place a few in gwe, less than a penny on the table, and I would know that she had nothing more to give. And I can tell you it humbled me enormously because I was there in good clothes. I had a car parked outside and I had money in the bank. And I would wonder about myself and my faith and what it was worth. And yet, you know, in spite of our Western materialism and the selfishness we all have, we all have something in common with those two widows and the Zambian mothers. For within each of us there lies a desire to help, to reach out, to reach out in love to others. Every one of you here can tell me stories of people who gave to you or to others, often a great personal sacrifice. The time I tend to hear it is at the time of a funeral. And people will tell me of the sacrifice their mother or their father or their grandparents made for them. Every family has such a story. It's part of who we are. And so what I want to hold up before you this morning is this amazing paradox in our human makeup because there lies within each of us two contrasting urges, two contrasting voices. There's the urge to have and to hold, and there's the urge to reach out and to help. One voice says, don't be a fool. Don't give your money away. A fool and his money are soon parted. And the other voice says, stop worrying about yourself. Don't worry about what you may need. Think about others who have so much less than we do. This little journey we're on will soon be over, and we can't take it with us anyway. So what can we say to these two sides of our nature? Well, there are, there in both of us, both sides in all of us. There's no point denying it. And it's, it's not wrong to want to acquire things and to make something of your life, that's not wrong. I mean, our Lord himself, in one of his parables, warned us against squandering the gifts that God gave us. And yet, and yet, my deepest hope is that you will remember that of the two urges, it is the one to give, the one to help, that is the most deeply Christian. It's also the one that is the most fragile and easily destroyed. And yet that desire to love and to reach out, that brings us closer to God than any other desire that we have within us. And in the end, being closer to God is the only security that really matters. Amen. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, help us to turn to you at all times and in all places and to remember that we are your children and you truly 
are our Father. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Our offering time is coming up, and uh, the hymn we're going to sing is a, a golden oldie called Blessed Be the Tie That Binds.
peace, knowing that you are loved and that the Spirit of God goes with you and that you can rise to meet each day and that you are strong enough for all that happens because you walk with God and God is with you. Through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Now, shall we join our hands and go in peace?